Hi, this is the chapter overview video for chapter 1, Units and Measurement. This is the first chapter of our first semester of general physics. And the purpose of the, this chapter is really to cover not quite the physics material, but the background material that we kind of assume that you know as you come into a physics class. And depending on your previous science education, the material that's covered in this chapter might be something that you already know. Then that's great. <laughs> More knowledge is great. And depending on your previous science education, the material in this chapter might not be something that you already know. Uh, if that describes you, what I would say is, don't worry about it. That's why this chapter exists, so that everyone can start on the same page, uh, regardless of what your previous preparation was. Uh, the textbook will cover everything that you need to know. So I would say, read the textbook from cover to cover, and you'll be fine. And this is the first section of the textbook that you should start reading. And sometimes I will cover in my lectures the same materials that are covered in the textbook, and I will highlight in this chapter overview videos when I cover the same materials uh, from the textbook. And sometimes I'll cover the same material in a different way. I want you to read everything and watch everything. Um, but in this overview videos, I'll highlight uh, which ones, uh, which sections that I also cover, and I'll invite you to watch the lecture videos. So section 1.1, the scope and scale of physics is that kind of background material that I was talking about. Uh, I don't cover this in the lecture, other than to say physics is the fundamental science. And I expect you to have uh, read through this section to kind of get a sense of the kind of topics that are covered under the umbrella of physics and the kind of the, the scale or the orders of magnitudes of uh, things that are covered in under the umbrella of physics. I do think there's one homework question that uh, deals with the numbers that are here about the number of heartbeats in a human lifetime. Um, so section 1.1, please read through it, especially because I don't really cover it in the lecture. And uh, units and standards. Now this, I did record a lecture video covering units, especially highlighting the difference between how other sciences, uh, such as chemistry, cover units and our physics approach to units. And uh, I guess you can kind of get it some sense of that in how we talk about the base and drive the units of the SI system, um, international system of units. And um, yeah, there's more detailed lecture, so I'll have you watch that. <laughs> also read it through the textbook. And uh, there's a wonderful history of how these, um, history of the definition of these units, how they were originally introduced. Uh, so there's that interesting history. I don't go into that in the lecture. Read the textbook, please. And metric prefixes, good to have some of them memorized. I think I have it memorized up to peta, maybe exa, some, uh, you know, with the increases in storages these days. And I think I have it memorized down to ado, like ado, there's something called the ado second pulse laser. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, some uh, basic ones like kilo, mega, giga, uh, milli, micro, nano, those are good to have memorized. If you are unfamiliar with these prefixes, then please, that's what this textbook table is for. Take some time looking at it and starting to memorize some of the more common ones. And I think that's it for section 1.2. And 1.3, unit conversion. Uh, there will be some homework questions that kind of have you practice unit conversion. And um, more often than that, you will see me use Olfram Alpha to do unit conversion. And I'll demonstrate using Olfram Alpha to do unit conversion elsewhere. We have computerized tools, Olfram Alpha, that's really good at unit conversion. So if for no other use, you can use that to double check if you have converted the units correctly. So, so 1.4, I don't quite cover this in lecture. I do give it a brief mention and just uh, highlighting the power of analyzing your unit. And uh, I'll leave it to this section to describe it in more detail. I think in this introductory class, we don't really use a dimensional analysis to its full 
capability that it can be used, especially in topics like modern physics. But um, I, I don't want you to read it through it, just to have an idea of what dimensional analysis refers to. And those of you, especially majoring in physics, you will see the power of this more the higher in physics you go. I think when I was an undergrad, I didn't fully appreciate the, all that focus on units and dimensional analysis. It's really when I was in grad school that I realized, oh yeah, it's a really powerful tool that rules out every single uh, wrong answer, answers that cannot possibly be right. So you can focus on the ans uh, kind of answers or expressions that have a chance of being right. So, um, so with that, I'll skip. I don't really cover in lecture. Read it in the textbook. Um, section one point five. I don't cover it at all. <laughs> I don't think there are even any homework questions that cover it. I will say that it's too. Uh, worthwhile for you to know about, uh, mainly on this basis. This is probably the one transferable skill, well, well maybe two transferable skills you get out of physics. One is just the general quantitative problem solving techniques, strategies. And this is a very particular type of the quantitative reasoning where you are working with a really limited uh, amount of knowledge. The example is, I think there's this question, you know, how many piano tuners are there in New York City? If someone asked you that, um, how many of you would say, I don't know, how am I supposed to know? But based on very, uh, with the techniques involved in Fermi calculation, with um, very little knowledge, with some reasonable assumptions, you can get a pretty good um, number. So for example, you can do this estimate based on, say, population of New York City and a fraction of households that have a piano and how many pianos a piano tuner might tune in a given year. So, you know, but maybe you don't even know how many people live in New York City. Then it becomes a matter of, well, do you think there are 100,000 people, a million people, 10 million people? Between those, it's probably closer to a million. So you start with a million people. And then, you know, households, average household size is three people. So divide by three, there are probably within an order of magnitude, 300,000 households in New York City. Then you start by, from there you estimate the number of pianos. Do you think 10% of households have pianos? 1% of households have pianos? Let me just guess 1% then there might be 3,000 um, pianos in New York City. Then and you go from there. Now, you know, all these estimates, it can be really wrong. It can be really off, especially for some of those estimates you are just pulling it out of your ass. But um, so this kind of estimating skill, it's the kind of thing, I think your textbook actually mentions it. However, these are exactly the sort of estimation problems that people in various tech industries, and I would also say in businesses, have been asking potential employees to evaluate their quantitative reasoning skills. And the reason businesses would be interested in this for, for their managers would be for things like, um, you know, if a, a business wants to decide to go into a new venture where they don't know a lot of knowledge about that area. They want to estimate the market size, if they have any chance of being competitive and being able to reason in the environment of limited knowledge. It's a, it's a useful skill. And um, Fermi calculation is an example of that. So I don't, again, I don't cover this in lecture at all. I recommend it to read it through this section and give it some practice. But uh, at the end of the day, this is not really the physics topic we cover in this class. That's why I don't lecture on it. Significant figures. Uh, let me just say we have a lab that's just focused on significant figures. So uh, let me just leave that for the lab. And I think uh, and you should read it through the section. And in terms of your uh, what you do practically with the uh, significant figures, I will tell you two things to avoid. One thing to avoid is just um, copying down every single number from your calculator. Like, you know, you uh, put in pi r squared and you get a number like this in your calculator and you copy every single one of those digits down. Please don't do that. Um, at the very least, it, it looks unprofessional. <laughs> so if your calculator gives you 10 units, 
Don't copy all of them. There are very limited set of circumstances where you should write down 10 significant figures and, um, and you, like, you should be able to give a reason, uh, why you wrote down all those 10 digits. If your answer is those were the numbers in the calculator, don't do that, please. <laughs> so you should round it. There are some significant figure rules and I, you know, we have, we have a lab where I do talk about some of those rules and when you might, want to ignore <laughs> some aspects of those rules. Um, and so that's one end where people just write down every single digit, don't do that. Uh, the other end is I've seen people where people round the numbers to, um, to how do I say, it? Um, too much. Um, so, so it gets maybe with these numbers, I can't give an example, uh, but I see this a lot in lab where uh, people report numbers with one significant figure or two significant figures, uh, maybe blindly following those rounding rules. And what I would say is a lot of those times, I wish you kept an extra significant figure because sometimes um, kind of subtle things that might be going wrong in the lab uh, when you round your numbers to one significant figure, like you say your result was 0.7. I really want, wish I could have seen it. Was it 0.71? Was it 0.78? And um, so, so you know, when in doubt, keep like one extra significant figure, but don't keep, you know, whatever not this number is, because that's unprofessional. So, so we'll do more of this in lab. And finally, section 1.7. It, it's a really good section. I do cover it in lecture, kind of. And I would say that uh, it's a good, section for you to read it through in detail and kind of mull over throughout the entire semester. We'll be teaching you some specific problem solving strategies and kind of familiar with the, with the general type of strategies good for the types of problems that might be new or might appear new to you. So those are the seven sections in chapter one. Um, videos. <laughs> Learn to do these overview videos uh, shorter. I'll try to do it shorter in the future. Um, and uh, uh, see you in the other lecture videos.